Hey guys, Jay Cena here from Australian Wealth, and today we are going to be talking about a topic which is shrouded in mystery for most people that are in their 20s and 30s in Australia, and that is how to buy a home. <music> Okay, so the first step to buying a home in Australia is to be really rich. <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course. Uh, but yes, anyone that knows anything about the Australian market knows that property values are very expensive, especially in the capital cities like Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. Once you start to get out into more of the regional areas, things become a little bit more affordable, but still, it's quite an expensive market here in Australia. So the most important thing to do when you're buying a home is to smash the like button and subscribe. Uh, that's gonna help the YouTube algorithm and get these videos out to more people. So if you could do that, that'd be fantastic. But of course, I think it is an achievable goal for most people to be able to purchase their own home. And there are some actionable steps to take. So I wanted to step through the process of how it actually all works because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of clear information on the internet about how it actually happens. So purchasing a home is something that's really exciting for a lot of people. But what I want you to remember is that I'm just some guy on the internet, this is for entertainment. And if you are looking at purchasing a house, it's great to go and actually speak to professionals in the industry that do it day in and day out. You need to do your own research and don't take advice from people on the internet like me. So there's a few things that you'll need to get in order when you're looking to buy a house. Now the first and the most obvious thing is you need to have a deposit. Lenders will usually accept anything over 10% when it comes to buying a house. In some circumstances, the government has allowed people to buy homes for 5% down uh, and those loans have government backing if the borrower cannot meet their repayments. However, for most people, 10% is gonna be the absolute minimum that you'll be able to put down. The thing is though, if you're not putting 20% down and you're doing less than 20%, you're going to have to pay lender's mortgage insurance, which is a cost that you're going to have to factor in when you are purchasing a home. So I find if you want to try and save as much money as you possibly can, then it's much better to put 20% down. You have more skin in the game, and then of course you don't have to pay lender's mortgage insurance. So depending on what area you're buying in, you're likely gonna have to come up with about $50,000 to $100,000 if you're putting 10% down or $100,000 to $200,000 um, if you're gonna be putting 20% down. Now, of course, the first house is always the hardest because you do need to come up with this additional money and there is no way around it. It's just the way it works. You need to have skin in the game. Another challenge that comes with saving up for a deposit is of course stamp duty, which is a terrible tax, uh, by the way, which is about four to five percent of the purchase price of the property. So that is something that you'll have to factor in also. The government has launched schemes for first home buyers to get rid of stamp duty. Um, if it is your first home and they have the first homeowners grant. However, if you're buying in Sydney, then it's pretty much useless because the house prices are so high. So there is a cutoff at about, I think $750,000 of the purchase price of the house. I think for vacant land, it's about 450,000. Uh, you're getting no stamp duty exemption. So you might be able to take advantage of this if you're in more of a regional area or a market that's not as high priced, but in Sydney, basically forget about it. Because of stamp duty, it's often a good strategy to purchase land and then build a home as opposed to purchasing a home which already exists on land because the tax obligation of paying uh, stamp duty is gonna be uh, quite a bit higher. So of course you need to talk to a tax pro about this, don't just take my advice. So the next thing that's really important and often overlooked by many people is your credit score. Now, building up a great credit score takes time. Lenders want to know that you're a reputable person to lend money to. And there needs to be a little bit of a track record there. So it's often a good idea to take out credit cards, you know, spend money on them, but pay it back before the day that it is due. And that way you're building up a credit history so lenders can see, okay, well this person has consistently been able to pay back their obligations. And as a result, they're going to look more favorably at you and you'll have a much higher credit score. In addition to this, having a good credit score will allow you to get access to much better loans. Uh, the interest rates are lower, so it's only gonna be something that's gonna help you in the future. So remember, good credit takes time to build up. So this is something that might take six months to a year to get right. 
So once you have your deposit and you have good credit, it's time to speak to a decent mortgage broker. Um, so we, we worked with a mortgage broker who was fantastic and for anyone that doesn't know, a mortgage broker compares all of the best loans that are available on the market. Some interest rates might be as high as a 3.5% at the moment, I've seen some as low as 2.5. So it's great to work with a mortgage broker who can get you the best loan for your particular circumstance. Uh, ANZ, for example, will take one year's tax returns if you're self-employed, but other banks might take two. So if you've suddenly started earning a lot more money and you wanna buy a home, it could be a good option to go with ANZ, whereas other banks might not actually offer that. So a mortgage broker works with these uh, lenders and banks all the time, so they're gonna be in the know in that sector. When you're speaking with a mortgage broker, they'll also be able to confirm what your borrowing capacity is, which is really important, and that means that you can set a decent price range for what you want to buy. So it's important when you're buying a home that you do look realistically at what you can afford to pay back because if you're spending too much on the interest payments then it's going to eat away at your financial health long term and you're going to be left in a much harder position. So it's often better to look at getting a lower priced house initially so you have something that you can sink your teeth into. So it's often better to get something below budget to start with although that can be quite hard in this current market because a real estate is expensive. So once your borrowing capacity is confirmed, you should get pre-approval from the lender of your choice. And that means uh, the bank is pretty much happy to lend you the money, uh, obviously pending you know, what you're going to purchase, et cetera, et cetera. So once you have pre-approval, you can put an offer down on land or property. And if that offer is accepted, uh, you will send the details of that back to the bank and the bank will give you formal approval. Once you have formal approval, that is where it is guaranteed that the bank will pay that money into the property, provided that you put your deposit in. So once you have that formal approval, that's the point where you can put your deposit down. So at this point, the contracts are drawn up. Uh, it's highly advised to have a qualified solicitor look through all the contracts uh, so that you have a clear understanding of your obligations. A solicitor will explain all of this in plain English because uh, there's a lot of legal jargon which goes into contracts. So having someone that can explain what your obligations actually are is very important. So conveyancing will cost you about 1500 bucks. So that is another cost that you will need to factor in when you are purchasing a house. So once you've read through the contract, then you sign the contract, you are not legally bound to the sale until contracts are signed and exchanged. There's usually a cooling off period um, if you change your mind, uh, but you may have to pay a penalty after the exchange. So once the contracts are exchanged, it's usually about six weeks between exchange and the settlement. The settlement is where you own the land. So during this period of time, you just wanna make sure that you have everything in order uh, that you need for the house, things like insurance and other costs that may come up. So on the settlement date, your solicitor, the vendor, which is the former owner of the property, and the bank manager will all get together and the bank will pay the remainder of the balance and the ownership of the property will be transferred to you. Stamp duty is also paid during the transfer of the property. It's not something that you can pay at a later date. It happens right when the settlement happens. And that is basically the process. At this point, you will be the owner of that land or the property and the title will be in your name. And you can look forward to plenty of mortgage payments in the future. So I hope you found this really interesting. That is the process of purchasing real estate in Australia. Of course, talk to all the right professionals when it comes to buying a home because it's a massive investment for a lot of people. So if you enjoyed the video, make sure you like and subscribe. And I'd like to hear from you about your home purchases and some of the things that you really struggled in. So please leave me a comment there. And uh, thank you for listening. Uh, my name is Jay, I'm from Australian Wealth and we'll see you later.